Hello, dear friends. Good to be with you again today. Uh, we're looking at uh, John chapter 18, uh, verses 12 through 14, and then also verses 19 through 24 today. So let's pray before we start reading. Father, we pray that you'd help us today to uh, not just look at the details and the facts of the uh, story of Jesus before Caiaphas and uh, Annas, but Lord, that we may understand the significance and the meaning of it. We pray that you'd protect us from religious leaders who don't love you and serve you, but also, Lord, that if we are those who are ministering in some way or the other, that we may not be like these men. Help us, we pray, as we examine your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, so today I'm going to look at uh, Jesus before the high priests, um, and um, remember we said last week that I'm going to divide John 18 into these four sections. Um, uh, Jesus' uh, betrayal uh, and Judas, uh, Jesus and the high priests, Judas, uh, Jesus and Peter's denial, and Jesus and Pilate. Um, now today's section uh, is, the, so we're going to skip over Peter in verses 15 through 18. Um, and we're going to uh, just focus on uh, Jesus and the high priest. Uh, it may be a shorter session today, but I pray, pray that the Lord will bless us as we examine his word. So uh, John chapter 18, let's read verses 12 through 14. Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Verse 19, the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. And Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who, you, uh, who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So let's get to the um, to verse twelve, um, and uh, really the message from the section is very simple today, um, and uh, and and I pray that it would just minister to us. Uh, but I didn't want to um, lump this together with Peter because it then really um, uh, dilutes the impact and the importance of the message concerning uh, Peter and his denial, and I felt I needed a, a full session for that. So uh, Peter, uh, sorry, Judas had now um, betrayed Jesus, and uh, they arrested him, and verse 12 says, and the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Now there's a, a few things that we must say um, on this verse, and and one of the things that you're going to see throughout the next few uh, sessions uh, and the next uh, chapter and uh, and a half um, of John is the cooperation between the Jews and the Romans in the trial or the mock trial of Jesus or trials of Jesus um, and his crucifixion. Um, I, I I keep hearing Christians talking about it was the Jews who killed Jesus. Um, uh, and, and yet it, it was the Jews together with the Gentiles. And remember that the Jews then represents all Jews and that the Gentiles, the Romans then, represent all Gentiles. In other words, it re they represent us. Uh, the same way as Adam represented us all when he sinned, uh, when the Jews crucified Jesus, they uh, crucified him on behalf of the whole of the nation and their descendants because they in fact said uh, the, his, his blood be on us and on our children. Um, and and when, the, when the Romans crucified Jesus, 
Uh, they acted as uh, surrogates or on behalf of each one of us. Um, and so they, they, we, we can't point the finger at the Jews. The Gentiles were just as implicit, and you'll find exactly in uh, these, uh, these passages uh, how that they worked and cooperated hand in hand for the destruction and the, and the um, murder um, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and so it's not just the Jews, it, it is the Romans. I admittedly, Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost and says, you, but he is preaching to the Jews. And he says, you uh, have taken him and killed him. And, and, and yet uh, that's Peter's emphasis preaching to the Jews. Um, but that does not exonerate the uh, Romans in their uh, part in the whole process. Um, and so here you see that in this verse, uh, that the detachment of troops, of troops is in italics, so the detachment, uh, these are the Romans with their captain and the officers of the Jews. These were the representatives of the Jews, so they were again cooperating. It wasn't like the Romans went out and got him, or that the Jews went out. They went out together, and they together arrested Jesus, and they bound him. And of course, this is a, um, a, a strange statement that they bound Jesus, because obviously the Son of God can never be bound. Uh, he, he binds, and what he binds cannot be loosed, and what he looses cannot be bound, but he is, uh, he is the eternal God in the flesh. Uh, he cannot be bound, um, but they obviously we understand the, the context. They bound him uh, from a human point of view. He could have called angels to set himself free. He could have broken, broken those, um, those ropes uh, without any hesitation, without any problem at all, um, but he willingly uh, submits to them. And um, as um, uh, one, one teacher, uh, in fact, Campbell Morgan says that uh, he wasn't bound by the ropes, he was bound by his love for you and I. And I think that that is, uh, that is true. Uh, so verse 13, and they led him away to Annas first, uh, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now you'll see that Annas is referred to also as the high priest. Annas was the official high priest from AD 6 to about AD 14. Um, so during Jesus's uh, growing up years, Annas was the high priest. Uh, he was then deposed. Remember, the high priests in those days were being appointed by the Romans. They were Roman puppets. Um, they uh, kept the people in check uh, for the Romans, and in exchange, they got good. Uh, they got paid good money. Uh, they got their share of the temple taxes um, and so on. Um, and so, Anna served for that uh, seven or eight years. Um, but after that, uh, five of his sons, and now Caiaphas, uh, his son-in-law, um, plus one of his grandsons, so he had five, six, seven um, of his descendants uh, ruling uh, as high priest. And obviously, uh, through that, he had tremendous influence um, uh, so he uh, he uh, uh, sees Jesus first uh, before Caiaphas even uh, uh, sees him. Um, so he is called, of course, the high priest, even though, uh, and remember, there can only be one high priest uh, under the Old Testament law, uh, but even in, uh, in Jesus' time, uh, there would only be one official high priest who would be appointed by the Romans. Uh, but that didn't mean that Annas didn't have tremendous influence uh, and was able to uh, to pull strings uh, behind the scenes, if you will. Uh, he's called the high priest um, in the same way, and the Mishnah makes provision for this, uh, in the same way that uh, American presidents continue to be called presidents, vice presidents continue to be called vice presidents, um, even after they have left office. So the title continues uh, even though the office may not continue. But in this case, uh, he had the title, uh, he had the power and the authority and the influence, 
Um, he just wasn't the official guy who would sign uh, at the end of the, uh, sign on the dotted line at the end of the day. Um, and so they they led him to Annas first, and obviously Annas's um, conclusions would uh, be uh, very influential on Caiaphas, who would then conduct the legal trial, uh, well, the so-called legal trial um, of Jesus after that. And so they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now, it was Caiaphas, the official high priest, the son-in-law, uh, who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Now, remember, we saw this in John chapter 11, um, and he's not making this statement, as some say uh, prophetically, that Jesus would die for the people. Um, and, and of course, we know that Jesus died for us, um, but that's not the way in which he said this. Um, he was simply saying, Jesus is a troublemaker. Uh, better that we kill him or that he die than he stir up trouble. And the Jews, and he said these words, that the, Jew, that the Romans then come and take away our place, meaning the temple. Um, and so Jesus was, uh, to, was, was to be uh, elim eliminated uh, simply uh, because it would be politically expedient. I'm going to come back to that idea uh, in, uh, in, in a moment. All right, so, so now we jump to verse 19. So we uh, ended in verse 14. Uh, we're skipping over the section of Peter. We'll come back to that next week. And verse 19, the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Now, uh, um, from John, this is difficult to uh, uh, see, and there is some debate as to whether the high priest here is Annas or Caiaphas. Um, uh, and it doesn't really matter because they, they, they're really operating in tandem. They're in cahoots. Uh, what one says, the other one says. Uh, so I'm not going to get into the argument whether this is Caiaphas or, um, or, or Annas. Um, the, so, um, and of course, this if this is Annas, uh, then this is an un unofficial trial because uh, he doesn't have the authority to hand Jesus over to the Romans or to condemn him. Uh, only the Sanhedrin together with Caiaphas could do that. Um, so, so, the, so he then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Um, now, Jesus is not going to answer concerning the, the disciples. So in the same way as in Gethsemane, he took the focus away from the disciples and focused purely on himself. Who are you looking for? I am he. Um, here he's doing the same thing. He's not going to answer about the disciples. Um, they had anyway disappeared. Only two of them were still there. John was still there, and Peter was there in the outer court. Um, and we'll we'll come back to those uh, next week. Um, but but he's uh, so Jesus is going to purely answer concerning his doctrine. And Jesus answered him, "I spoke openly in the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where the Jews always meet, and in secret." I have said nothing. Now, there's something happening behind the scenes here. Um, uh, he's asking Jesus about his doctrine, and Jesus is refusing to answer because uh, he would incriminate himself. Now, according to the law, um, the, um, the, the defendant, uh, the one who is on trial, um, could only be condemned on the mouth of two or three witnesses. He could not be condemned on his own testimony. So he could not self-incriminate himself. Um, and that's clearly spelled out in the book of, of Exodus. So what Jesus is doing here is he is, uh, well, he's doing a number of things. But the first thing he's doing is he is saying uh, to, uh, uh, to the high priest, you are you are um, uh, being unjust. You are breaking the law in asking me to incriminate myself. You should be uh, calling witnesses. I spoke openly, so call the witnesses. Let them tell you. 
what I say and what I what I taught. And it's not like they didn't know what Jesus was teaching. Both Annas and Caiaphas knew exactly what Jesus was teaching. There was a constant stream of um, uh, of tattletales uh, who were running to them all the time, saying, Jesus did this, Jesus did that, he healed on the Sabbath, he's done this and the other thing. Um, so they knew. Um, and so Jesus is, uh, is saying, uh, stick to the law. Uh, don't ask me to incriminate myself. You are, call the witnesses. And of course, they would call witnesses, but they would be uh, false witnesses. So Jesus answered, I spoke openly in the world. Always, I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where, and we can insert where all the Jews meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. So the second thing Jesus is doing and we'll see how that Jesus puts Pilate on trial, and, and Jesus is in, fact, uh, in effect putting the high priest on trial here. Because what he is saying is, you guys were uh, conspiring in secret, and they'd been conspiring for months uh, how to arrest Jesus and how to get rid of Jesus. And they had had all sorts of secret meetings between themselves and between the, uh, the, the Sanhedrin um, and, and were uh, trying to find ways in which they could trip Jesus up and, and somehow also avoid the uh, wrath of the, of the crowd. Um, and so Jesus is saying, I didn't act in secret. I acted openly. While you, in fact, and he's inferring you, the guys, who are, are working in secret. And so he says, I, I spoke openly. I, I have nothing to hide, uh, Jesus is saying. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple uh, where the Jews uh, meet, and, and in secret I have said nothing. Now, it doesn't mean that Jesus didn't say things to his uh, disciples, to the apostles, uh, when they were alone and in private, but he's saying, I didn't say anything differently. I didn't say anything in secret that I have not said openly. Um, and so verse 21 then says, he says, Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I've said. So he's saying to him, stick to the law. Call the witnesses. Because there are thousands of witnesses who had heard Jesus preach and knew the message that he, that he brought. And when he had said these things, one of the officers, officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand. He slapped him, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Now, um, it's possible, and uh, one commentator suggests that uh, Jesus was uh, angry and that he um, angrily replied and that elicited the response of the officer. The, the officer here, by the way, is, uh, is a Jew. He is part of the temple police. Um, um, be that as it may, um, what he has done here is illegal. Now, the whole of the trial of Jesus before Annas and then Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin was illegal. And there are several books written on this. Um, it's a very interesting thing that you can follow up for yourself. The many aspects of the trial of Jesus that was uh, that was illegal. It was illegal to to hit a, a defendant unless he had been found uh, guilty and and sentenced. Um, the uh, it was obviously illegal for him to uh, call Jesus to incriminate himself. So that was the second problem. Um, it was illegal for Annas to have a trial um, without the Sanhedrin present. And then when the Sanhedrin did meet, and by the way, John doesn't speak, us, speak to the, uh, the meeting of the Sanhedrin, um, uh, Matthew and Luke do, um, but the, uh, that, that whole trial was illegal. It happened at night. It wasn't supposed to happen at night. Um, and uh, on, on a whole bunch of issues, um, it was illegal. The witnesses they called uh, were false witnesses and contradicted themselves until uh, they got their story straight. I mean, this is uh, this is happening in in front of uh, the the whole of the Sanhedrin, and or certainly a lot of the Sanhedrin. Maybe all were not present. Um, and and then you know, in front of them, these two witnesses eventually listen to each other's story and they get their story straight. Um, and and it's and it's and it's false. Uh, so so the the whole of the trial of Jesus before the Jewish leaders 
was a mistrial, and I, I've, I've forgotten, but there are 20 or 30 points of the Jewish law that they broke in, uh, in, in trying and in convicting uh, Jesus. But this is one of the things that they were not allowed to do, uh, was to strike Jesus. And, and you'll see this later on in the book of Acts, uh, this, a similar event happens. All right, now verse 23, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? And I think Jesus is saying two things here at the same time. Because remember, the high priest asked him uh, to explain his doctrine. And Jesus says, ask the witnesses. And so he is saying then to the high priest that uh, if I have uh, spoken evil, if I have preached heresy, uh, or if I've uh, blasphemed, well, then where are the witnesses? Um, but if I have spoken well, and obviously Jesus always spoke well, um, uh, why do you strike me? So, so uh, he's speaking to the high priest, but now he's also speaking to the, um, the, the policeman, um, the servant of the high priest who, is, who, who slapped him. And he, he is asking uh, him, what did I say? Now, it may have been in the tone that Jesus used. The, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about that. Um, but you can see what Jesus, uh, what Jesus had said. All Jesus said is, call the witnesses. Don't ask me, call the witnesses. He was entitled to say that. And so he is saying to the man, you struck me unjustly because I didn't say anything uh, and remember that that the the basis on which he could be uh, that he uh, that he could be judged is that if he said anything disrespectful to the high priest um, in the book of Exodus, uh, it deals with this. But uh, Jesus had not um, insulted the high priest. Uh, he hadn't said anything about the high priest. All he had said is uh, you need to ask the witnesses because that is what the law requires. So you can see how unjust this whole process is. Now, uh, we, we come to the, um, to the last verse, and you think, well, you know, we've only started. Um, well, I'm, I'm then going to explain to you the significance of this whole thing. It says, Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest, now, it may appear that the previous section from verse 19 that we've just dealt with, um, that this uh, is before Annas, because Annas then sends him to Caiaphas. Um, but as I said earlier, it's, it seems that there's confusion as to whether this, in fact, is happening before Caiaphas or before Annas. When he sends him to Caiaphas, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's in another place. Um, it may just simply have been in another room. Um, because they're in um, in the high priest's palace, um, which is uh, attached to the temple, um, and so uh, he he then sends him to to Caiaphas, and and that's where John ends this part. Uh, the next thing we see is that uh, they hand him hand Jesus over to Pilate. Now, in between, what John doesn't deal with, and obviously I'm not going to deal with that because we're simply dealing with what John says. Um, is the trial before the Sanhedrin, uh, before the 70 plus one uh, leaders of Israel, the elders of Israel. Um, and, and so John skips over that. And, and the reason is because John is not giving us a step-by-step -step, uh, historical narrative. He is focusing on the key figures, and particularly John uh, 18, as we've said, uh, are these the key figures in that whole picture is Judas, who betrays Jesus, uh, Peter, who denies him, uh, the high priest, uh, Caiaphas and Annas, uh, who uh, hand him over unjustly, and then Pilate, who crucifies him. Uh, those are the four characters, and, that's, and, and for that reason, John does not go into the issue of the Sanhedrin. Um, it may also be that uh, by now John uh, knows that the other Gospels, or at least one of the other Gospels, had been written and that this had been covered. Um, it, it, it doesn't matter, uh, really, because the focus here is on the personalities. Um, and so the, the question then is, what is the significance of all of this? Because it seems to be just a, 
um, a, a narrative, a historic narrative, just a uh, account of the technical things that happen. Now, uh, just as I've just said to you, um, John doesn't deal with uh, the Sanhedrin because he is focusing on these personalities. And, and so in that is a message. Uh, this is, uh, if John was giving a, a, a detailed um, chronological step-by-step -step analysis of what was happening, uh, then that would be different. But that's, that's not what John is doing. Um, he, is, he, he is highlighting the role that these various people had. And of course, the significance of this is, uh, is Jesus' trial before the religious leaders. That's really the point that he is making here. Uh, when it comes to Judas, the point is that my best friend turned against me. When it comes to Peter, the point is clearly that my closest associate uh, denied that he even knew who I was. When it comes to Pilate, um, the, the statement is that the, that the Roman governor, um, against his own conscience, knowing what is right, condemned him to death. When it comes to Annas and Caiaphas, it focuses on the role of religion as opposed to the gospel, the religious leaders turning against the Lord Jesus Christ. And this has been true through the centuries. Um, and remember, Jesus warns his disciples that they will, they will bring you before the leaders, the spiritual leaders. They will bring you before the synagogues. Um, and so the religious people, Jesus promised his disciples or, pr or predicted to his disciples, the religious leaders will persecute you. And so Jesus is not uh, being persecuted. He's not being um, killed um, by the secular leaders, but by the religious leaders. Now, obviously, when we say religious, these people were not Christians, of course. Uh, they were not even good Jews. Uh, they were political puppets, but they sat in positions of of power in the religious system. Now, we know how that over the centuries, millions of people were killed in the Inquisition, how that many others were killed during the Reformation by the Reformers, uh, by people like Luther, Luther and Calvin and, and, and others. Um, and, and we can go on uh, talking right down through the history, how that uh, this, that the so-called religious establishment has always hated Jesus and his followers, even though they do it in his name. Um, and remember, Jesus said that they will do it thinking that they're doing God a favor. Um, now, he, he, here's the problem. Um, does this mean then that we should not have anything to do with any kind of of religion. Uh, in other words, should we not have anything to do with Christianity? Shouldn't we be part of a church? Because every church has, has its leaders. No, we obviously need to be part of the uh, local church. And that has, here's the pro one of the problems is that there are many people today uh, who are not uh, willing to go to church because they have seen how that spiritual leaders abuse their power. But the fact that spiritual leaders abuse their power does not mean that they are not good shepherds, that there are not good men who love the Lord and love his people and are faithful to the word of God. And so we, because there are bad sheep or bad uh, uh, shepherds, it doesn't mean that we, we throw all the shepherds out. Um, unfortunately, there are many who do that. There are many who speak out very publicly uh, against any form of shepherd. No, the system that Jesus inst instituted is that the, that the churches would be led by local elders and that there would be spiritual leaders. Um, those leaders have a responsibility to correctly represent the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the chief shepherd of the, of the church. Um, of course, there are indictments against the false uh, uh, elders and the false shepherds, just as there were indictments in Ezekiel 34 against the false uh, shepherds of Israel. But there is still a true shepherd, and his name is Jesus. And he has those who are his true under-shepherds. And so, first of all, how do we apply this? What, what, what am I trying to say to you? Well, 
first of all, I'm trying to say to you, yes, there are the religious leaders, and they may be, and, and we're not necessarily even talking about people in, in, in mainline churches, in Catholicism or Anglicanism. We're not talking about cults. There are spiritual leaders in uh, uh, evangelical churches and Pentecostal churches and charismatic churches who are abusive, uh, who uh, do not love the Lord and who do not love His people, and all they're in for in it for uh, in it is for money, uh, and that was what drove Annas and Caiaphas. It, it was money. They were they were put very wealthy and lived in palaces, um, and they abused God's people for money. Now, the other thing I want to draw out of this passage is that the high priest were, or high priests were doing this for money, but also they had become puppets of the state. They were um, keeping the people in check uh, in order to please the Roman government. And sadly, today there are many pastors, particularly in evangelicalism and in Pentecostal churches and charismatic churches, but others also, who have become puppets of the earthly government, whether it's here in America or whether it's in England or anywhere else in the world, where they preach a nationalistic message, where they promote a politician um, above the Lord Jesus in many cases. Um, I'm, I'm horrified when I listen to some of these men preach. Uh, they, they, they know the Constitution of the United States better than they know the Bible. Uh, the Constitution has become their Bible. Uh, they, their whole motivation is a political motivation. And that's exactly what the problem with Annas and, and Caiaphas. Uh, these men were not uh, spiritual leaders. They were political animals. Uh, they, they had one concern only, and that was to please their Roman overlords, their Roman masters who were pulling the strings and paying the money. And sadly today, there are thousands and thousands of preachers all over the world, but particularly in America, who are simply representatives of an earthly government and an earthly man. And they represent that man uh, with everything that they have, and they will lead the sheep uh, into uh, to the slaughter, as it were, because they don't represent Jesus. They represent a government or a uh, authoritarian figure. May God help us that we may understand that the role of a shepherd has nothing to do with uh, keeping the people in order. Uh, to please a government. They're not there to represent an earthly governor. They are there to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, it's not the government who's going to call you to give an account if you're a pastor for, the, for, for what you've done in your local assembly. It's the Lord Jesus to whom we must give an account for the sheep that God has given us. And so there are shepherds today who, will, who do abuse God's people. And it's often about power on the one hand and money on the other hand. And so be warned about them. Be careful. Don't follow or submit yourself to men where there's any indication uh, that they are in it for money or that they're in it for power or that they don't sacrificially love God's people. Shun them. Find good shepherds. There are good shepherds. That's the second point. Find a good shepherd and submit to them. Entrust yourself to them. I know it's hard to trust men when you've been burnt many times. And many of us have been burnt. I have been burnt by the religious systems over and over and over again. And yet I still continue to be part of a local church because I believe that that is God's will for each one of us. We can't uh, um, jump ship simply because, uh, because there, is, uh, th there is wrong in, uh, in the ship or wrong in the church. And so find a good shepherd, find a good church, find good elders, and submit yourself and work with them. That is God's plan and God's purpose. But then also I want to address those, and, and I know there are some who watch who are leaders in some form or the other. Maybe you're a deacon or an elder or a pastor. Maybe you're full-time, part-time. It doesn't matter. Brother, you have a responsibility before God 
to be like Jesus and not like Caiaphas or Annas, to be uh, one who lays down his life for his sheep. Remember Jesus says and said in John 10, in the same gospel we're studying now, that a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's Jesus. But he expects each one of us who are shepherds to lay down our lives for the sheep. And yes, the sheep are abusive. We've spoken about priests, uh, about shepherds who are abusive of the flock. But at the same time, there are, there are flocks that are abusive of their shepherds, and I've suffered at the hands of, of people for a, a long time. But it doesn't deny that God desires for us to be shepherds um, and to lead people, even if they're obstinate and even if, they're, um, if they bite the hand of the shepherd. God will deal with them. But you need to represent the Lord Jesus. And you need to, like him, uh, not open your mouth, but just allow the Lord to vindicate for you, while at the same time speaking the truth. You can see Jesus here. He doesn't deny the truth. He, does, he speaks the truth. And he says, basically, in effect, he's saying the law requires witnesses. You call the witnesses. And so Jesus speaks the truth. You need to speak the truth, but you need to speak it in love. You need to love the folk. Um, I know it's easy to become bitter and angry and frustrated with folk who abuse you and just want you for their own use and their own purposes. Be a good shepherd. And if you've abused, repent of that. You can change. Peter changed. We're going to see that ne next week. The, the gospel is able to change us. The word of God is able to change us. And so let me conclude by saying that the fact that there are false preachers, false shepherds, just like Annas and Caiaphas were false shepherds, false high priests, they were wolves in sheep's clothing. They wore all the religious garb and robes of their office, but they were wolves. There are wolves in the church today. Be careful of them. But there are good shepherds. Hear the voice of the shepherd and follow the voice of the shepherd. Father, we pray that you would help us to discern. Lord, it's so difficult today because there are so many who uh, appear to be religious, who appear to be good pastors or shepherds or elders, and yet they are not. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to Find those who are good and submit ourselves to them. I pray, Lord, for any pastors and elders or shepherds who are watching today. Help us, Lord, to represent the Lord Jesus accurately, to be those who love you and love your people and who are willing to lay down our lives for them, that they too might be saved. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us uh, in this whole discussion. I pray, Lord, particularly today as we find ourselves where many religious leaders have attached themselves to the government and have become puppets of the government, just as these men were puppets of the government. I pray, Lord, that you would bring conviction to their hearts, that they may understand that they are not here to represent Rome or any earthly government, but they are here to represent the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you.